listening to Finding Your Genius Zone with Dirk Nouvelle. It's not just a job. It's not just a paycheck. Or at least it doesn't have to be. With the help of experts across industries, Dirk helps you find your passion and career, as well as exposing the unknown parts of every vocation. Let's go deep. Let's find your genius zone right now. Here's Dirk Novell. Hey, everybody. This is Dirk Novell. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, I have a friend that's been a long time since I've seen him, uh, Rich Staginga. And it's funny, we were just joking about the pronunciation of his name. Uh, and so he can talk about that in a little bit. But just to give you a backdrop, Rich is um, one of my best friends growing up. Uh, his sister married Rich, and her name is Ona. She's one of the coolest uh, young ladies I've ever met. And so we would spend a lot of time uh, doing everything, concerts at the Gorge, uh, partying. I mean, Rich was kind of like part of my friend uh, group because of the connection. And, you know, it's interesting. Like, I just been talking to him a little bit just now, and it's been over 10 years, and it's sad because life happens and you move on. He was downloading me on his kids and what they're up to. But he's just one of those guys that I've always looked up to. And when I started thinking about this podcast, you know, I really wanted to have him on because because he's so likable. But I also think he's got such a cool career. Uh, he's a fireman. And, and, you know, there's a lot about that job that we probably don't know about. And I, I'm hoping that we can kind of get behind the curtains a little bit and understand the lifestyle of that career a little better. But I'm going to stop yapping. And uh, Rich, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to be here. Good to see you again, Dirk. Thank you. And where are you coming out of today? Is it Snohomish? I am in my house in Snohomish. Okay, cool. I can't say it's my office. It's my wife's office. So uh, you're a smart man. Yeah. <laughs> the ver language, we learn lang the right language quickly, don't we? Yeah, that's right. That is absolutely right. So you heard the introduction. I mean, anybody can Google like and watch TV or movies and they think they know what a fireman is. So just talk to us a little bit about, you know, your role in, in that industry and maybe if it's changed over the years, maybe how you got into it. And then we'll kind of get deep behind the scenes a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so I work for the Seattle Fire Department and each individual city has their own fire department there. You're a you're an employee of the city, basically. And uh, I've been doing it for 26 years. I work at a station, Station 38. It's right by the Metro Market by Children's Hospital. And I've been there for. I don't know, the last 10 years or so. And prior to that, I was in various places in Northgate for about 10 years. And then I came into the department uh, down in Rainier Valley and spent some time down there. And so uh, it's been really nice. I've been able to move around the city, um, going to the University of Washington. I really like that northeast kind of portion of the city. I'm super familiar with it. Um, you know, so uh, I was, I was, before I was in the fire department, I was working for a public relations company uh, called Northwest Strategies, um, kind of found my way to that, uh, meandered around, uh, I spent a lot of time in the restaurant industry, uh, waiting tables, bartending, uh, I was a beer rep for a little while for Hales Ales way back in the day, and uh, I was sitting behind my desk ghostwriting some newsletter for Group Health Hospital, like trying not to fall asleep, drinking coffee, and just sitting in my little cubicle, just yeah. hating life. And my friend Brent Seitzma calls me on the phone. He's like, hey, you know, we're going to be playing soccer on the lid. You know, come on by. And I'm, I'm, playing, I'm playing soccer with Brent. And there's another guy who's a Seattle fireman named Paul Lichtenauer. And we go out afterwards to the rowie and have a couple beers after playing soccer. And I'm talking to these guys and they're like, they're giving each other crap constantly. They're laughing. They're having an awesome time and they're great guys. And I'm like, you know, huh? What, you know, tell, how did you guys, I'm doing exactly what you're doing now. How did you guys start doing this? And it just kind of schooled from there. And, and, it's a, it's a strange kind of uh, career entry because you have to take tests 
And it takes, it's not the normal kind of hiring process. It took me about two and a half years for the, for the Seattle Fire Department to call me and say, hey, come on down for our recruit class, for our recruit school. Okay, real quick, so, I don't mean to interrupt you. So yeah, yeah. were you, you weren't a fireman yet. I, Mercer Island, the Rowie, I get it. I know where you're at, good spot. So were you actually in the PR world at that time and then these guys were firemen? Uh, yes, exactly. I was in the PR world. Got it. Kind of, you know, I was looking about how my career projection is going to be. How, where should I work? I interviewed at Microsoft. Um, I interviewed at the Rocky Company. It was a big PR firm back in the day. Um, but just was not, it's it's so good that I did not get hired. Yeah. So real quick, let's just, I just want to jump into like you coming out of UW, you were SIG up right yeah with my buddy alexi um and you came out of uw and then did you just jump right into like the beer world uh repping uh, hails or did what, what did you do right out of uw uh well my original plan was i was going to move to stun valley and i was just going to wait t- i had a bartending job set up at the sawtooth club yeah we were probably no nah, we weren't there yet but we were there a year after that probably or two years yeah, and I we had, I had spent a winter there during school. Yep. I was on a bit of a long undergraduate journey where I would take winter quarters off and then go ski and work. And uh, and I went to Alaska for a little bit. And uh, so uh, redirect me here. What was uh, where? Were yeah, we? so I was just trying to get like um, familiar with. Okay, so you came out of UW and you kind of bounced around um what i'm really curious on is like was it just like hey man i gotta get a job I'm like maybe it's sun valley and i'm gonna ski what was driving you it was just like hey i need to get a job or were you like the career world can wait i'm i want to go have some fun well it was a little bit uh pragmatic in that i needed money gotta pay rent you know gotta need gas money need beer money um young enough that it's not life is not so uh serious yet at that point you know you always feel you're young and you feel like you have infinite amount of time some people feel like they have an infinite amount of time some people probably feel my god i just got out of college and i got to get a job but that was not necessarily the way i was feeling i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna take my time on this and figure it out and honestly dirk i had no idea i had no idea what i wanted to do yeah. But I knew I was good at my current job and uh, I was fairly, fairly certain that whatever I kind of decided to try, I'd be okay at. Okay. And so I just tried a bunch of different things. Cool. And I didn't, I didn't, uh, it was a little purposeful. Um, it got a lot more purposeful with the public relations and moving into kind of the business world and um, it got a little more serious, but prior to that, it was like, you know, I'm going to try some stuff out. I worked for princess tours. Um, I could always get a bartending job, you know, and pay rent and gas and stuff. So, so you weren't super stressed, like, oh my God, I got to go to wall street or you're just like, listen, I'm going to just check it out and see what happens. And you, you were kind of cool with it. I was at that time. And then I met my wife, I met Ona. And there, there's always something that happens when you're young and then you meet, you know, your, your first thought is like, wow, could this be the one? And then it turns out. Then you out met her brother and you said, nah, <laughs> yeah. right? I, know, I didn't care what Eric said. I said, I'll, I'll fight you for her. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so, okay. So, no, I get it. So you met Ona and then did it, was it like life change? Like, okay, I got to get a little more serious. Well, you know, I'm lucky in that we're pretty we're pretty aligned in the way we think and see things. So there wasn't this, we were pretty happy. I mean, we were just kind of being happy and renting a house. It was different back then because you could just rent a house. I mean, do you remember you could just rent a house for like 1200 bucks. We had a nice house in Ballard for 1200 bucks a month. Yeah. I remember there wasn't student loans weren't a big deal. I, I, you know, I paid for my way through college, so I didn't have a bunch of student loans. And there wasn't this pressure that the kids coming out now, I mean, they might graduate with $150,000 on tap. And then it's just like, bam, here you go. That's a really good point that hasn't been brought up is like, you know, when I was young, I had to walk to school in the snow. And for, I mean, you know, that was what my dad used to say. But nowadays, like, I'm like, I'm having a hard time, you know, I'm trying to think 
they seem to have it pretty good. But the truth is the debt. I mean, it's 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 crazy how expensive school is right now. But yeah. but let's do this. Okay, I was just kind of getting a feel for, you know, you kind of moved around. So you're at the Rowie having a couple beers with these guys and they kind of gave you an introduction into the world. You're like, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, so t t walk through, like for someone who wants to be a fireman or a firewoman, I don't know what the proper way of saying it is. Firefighter is the uh, non-gender okay. term. Yeah, was. I'm learning, I'm learning all that stuff. Um, walk us through like, you know, maybe it's changed since you started, but like if somebody's interested in this profession, it's not like they can snap your fingers and go do it. There's a lot of process uh, involved, correct? Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a prescribed path and it's uh, it's you'll you just have to you put you submit an application. You go to the city of Bellevue or you go to the city East Side Fire now is what it's called. You go to the city of Seattle, you submit an application, and that is literally the first thing that you have to do. But uh, there's after you go, <clears throat> you submit an application, you'll go through a series of interviews. They will have a um, oral board that you sit in front of. It's very unnerving. You're sitting in front of three very stoic firefighters in their dress uniforms, and they're asking you questions, and they have their little list of bullet points in front of them that you get points for as you say what they're looking for. And it's a way to make the test equal for everybody. So, um, but it's very intimidating. You have to sit there, you go through this thing and, and then you have to take a physical test. Back in my day, the physical test was fairly significant and uh, it's changed a little bit now. It's a little less emphasis on that, but uh, a big part of it is you have to be in really good physical shape. Like me, because just like you, yeah. Like your body's okay. a temple, right? It used to be. <laughs> I don't. It depends how you define temple, but so yeah, that's interesting. I, it, I wonder why it's gotten a little easier physically. Like, it, what is that about? Like, why? Why has they? Why have they lowered the bar a little bit on the on the test? Well, I think they're trying to cast a little bit of a wider net for candidates, mm. and they're not looking necessarily for the. Uh, you know, the retired NFL linebacker or, you know, Eric Lane was in my recruit class. He played with the Seahawks for 10 years. We'd commute together They're, You know, they're, they're not necessarily, we're moving past that and we're starting to figure out that there are lots of gifts that people have to bring to this super dynamic job. You don't necessarily just need to rip the door off the hinges. There's other ways to get into the building. So I think that was kind of, that's been primary, the primary driver. And it's actually, I really like our department is very, very diverse and very, uh, we have diversity initiatives all the time. And uh, we have a, quite a few female firefighters. Um, I think we might have the most, well, I think we're the biggest department in the state, but we have a lot of female firefighters. And without exception, every single time I get a chance to work with them. It's just such, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's really fun. Um, I grew up with two sisters, so it's not, it's not uncomfortable or anything. Um, and so it's, it's a very diverse environment and uh, the physical standards that we were doing with carrying 275 pound dummies up the stairs was just a no-go for some folks. And that's, that's, you know, we don't necessarily need to have that. We, we don't, we don't need to do that. So, so they've changed a little bit. They've changed a lot. Yeah. In the 20, 26 years I have been there, uh, the whole fire culture has changed for the better for, Oh my God, for so much, the better it's a, uh, it's a paramilitary organization. So you'll have your chiefs, your captains, your lieutenants, your firefighters, and, uh, and you know, when it's going down and the house is on fire, you got to follow orders because somebody's in charge, somebody's coordinating all the units that are coming and they have to, you have to be able to, to direct people to do something, you know, they're going to do it. So there's a, there's a paramilitary type of element to it, but all the captains and lieutenants were once firefighters. So, you know, it's, I've, I've never really. There's a few exceptions, but I've never really run into any problems with that. And I don't have a military background. In fact, I come from completely the opposite. 
So it's not, it's not a prohibitive thing or it shouldn't be, it shouldn't stop somebody from, from thinking about it. So, so for folks watching, um, it, it seems like there's a variety of, of skill sets, variety of personality types. I mean, really anybody, I guess that's committed to serving and helping, right. Uh, yeah. could, could fit into this world. Yeah. I mean, they have, you, you'll go through a psychological interview where there's a psychological profile where it's, it's about 500 questions, believe it or not. And they're looking for these parameters of like-minded individuals that are going to be able to operate in a team, in a stressful situation, in, under authority, uh, independent in some cases. So there is a little bit of a psychological test. And then you have to do an FBI background check also. Yeah. So, I mean, you do have to be kind of a clean, you got to be a clean lever. You got to have a clean record. Um, yeah. You know, you have to be open to, to working with other people. So uh, I'm thinking of something that's interesting is like, you know, what I'm trying to do on this podcast is just educate people like before they spend a lot of time and money and resources to go down a path to make sure it feels right. And the other thing too is like, I want them to pay attention to what their innate natural gifts and skill sets are, um, you know, versus just like, you know, running to go be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, because their mom and dad thinks it's good or, you know, they live in Bellevue and they look around and it's just super competitive. And so it's kind of like, but the, the getting out there and taking action, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. It's like dating. You got to go out and see what you like. Um, but I also think it's, I think it would be great if younger adults and people who are changing careers or choosing careers spent more time analyzing um, who they are and what environments, et cetera, they would fit in. So when you're talking about like all these things, it's like, okay, so someone's interested in being a firefighter and they're going down all these roads, but you don't really know. I mean, I, I, I'm just thinking personally, I don't know how I would react when the shit hits the fan and I'm, I'm going into a house that's burning. And I mean, like, how do you know, like, do these tests really clearly, you know, uncover someone's ability to perform under I, I i think it's more of kind of a metric to measure a, a type of person that has the chance of being successful okay it's not a it's not a quantifiable you know you're going to do great in this areas and you're not going to do well in those areas it's uh it's a super super dynamic job like the the appeal to me is that when I go to work every day, literally every single day is going to be different. Somebody might call, there might be a couple, you know, there's similarities that go on with your day, but literally you have no idea what your day is going to be like. There might be days, you know, we've had a couple of them. I've had a couple of them in 26 years where it was a shutout, like no calls. And, and you're like, Whoa, what was that? That was yeah. weird. Like, you know, is there, is, is it zombie land out there? What happened? You know? And uh, so it's a super, super dynamic environment and you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to react. You literally, people call, pick up the phone. They say, I need help. And you hop in your fire engine and you drive as fast to where they are and you do your best to help them. It's, it's really, really unique and it's really awesome. And then they're always happy. They're always happy that you showed up and you helped them. You know, it's the, the police also do that. But people don't tend to be as happy when they show up or, you know, wave at them with all five of their fingers. So, you know, it's 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 different. It's a helpful job. But, yeah. uh, you know, and it, it could just be something from a senior citizen that's fallen down or it could be a choking baby or it could be, a, you know, you're, you're doing CPR on somebody in the middle of a restaurant. You know, yeah. you just really have no idea what you're going to do. So you train and you practice for a pretty wide variety, you know, scale of scenarios. And then when you're new, you just follow, you follow, you just follow the guys like, okay, I just yeah. learned. How yeah. to do that. So, I mean, if you're a creature of habit and you just like to kind of know what you're going to do every day and you don't want to veer off, I mean, it's probably not the right career path for somebody that, you know, is maybe an introvert and they just kind of want to sit at a desk and crunch numbers. 
No, I mean, you're in the firehouse for 24 hours with your crew. I work on, I work in a single house. There's four, four firefighters. There's an officer, a driver, and two tailboarders. And so we spend 24 hours together twice a week. So, I mean, you're spending a significant amount of time with these people and you have to be able to kind of, you got to roll with it. There's some stressful things that happen. You screw up sometimes. You got to be able to get past that. Somebody else screws up. You got to be able to get past that. There's a lot of grace and, um, you know, just love that goes on between, on your crew, between your coworkers, which is another really super awesome thing. You get to know each other's wives and their kids and their families and their dogs. And so you, you have to be able to kind of mix it up with a wide variety of, of people. Yeah. The bonding must be, cause I mean, it could be life and death, right? So yeah. it's like war, you know, like your yeah. son who's in the air force. Um, okay. So, Again, I mean, you're a smart guy. You you did your due diligence. You ask a lot of questions, but like, what are the things that have surprised you that you didn't see coming? Like, whoa, I didn't expect this in this career. Uh, you if know, any, not not to be gross, but like human, yeah. the human form, and how how like gross sometimes the human form can be seeing accidents bodily fluids smells literally you'll read about a book like it hits you in the face it hits you in the face like you open the door and just you're like okay i gotta I, i'm going in I'm going in there um that was something that nobody really talks about you know my emt class you're learning your physiology and and uh you know, emergency medicine and stuff like that. But nobody really talks about the practical application of just being a human being. Like you need to just sometimes just holding a little old lady's hand and telling her it's going to be okay. And by yeah. the way, she might be naked and you just came into her house. I mean, it's like, oh my God, you know, how, how horrifying this must be to this person, but they need help. And you, you gotta, you know, they, maybe they've been down for a couple of days and you got to give them the hospital and, you wrap them up in a blanket and you, but it's, it's the humanity. I think that, uh, that really after 26 years is the thing I value most about this job is just being able to be in the front row of life and just being able to be very, very human with people. I like that. Yeah. Uh, can you think of, uh, another one or two things that just kind of threw you? Um, you know, I talked about culture. And I talked about spending 24 hours together. Sometimes it can feel like 48 if you're not, if it's not a good situation or a good fit with a particular group of people. And uh, it can feel like you're there for 48 hours and you're, you're literally running for your car. It's not all, it's not always so great. And I, I, my, I have the greatest respect for some of the first female firefighters that took on this job to be pioneers in this role because it was such a male dominated soldierly type of environment. And for some of these women that, that took this on to break that barrier and get, they just, just existing in this zone of dudes constantly must have just been so difficult. And, uh, and so you know, to not draw a parallel, because I don't really have any direct, I can't speak to that, obviously. But being in a in a in an environment that maybe you it's not your match personality, and then you just find another crew, another station, and you kind of keep going. I, I worked with the same guys for 18 years. I was really, really lucky. They both retired. But uh, I felt like, you know, my two best friends are leaving, and they were. But you could kind of keep you you kind of keep going until you find your people, just like in life, you find your people. Yeah. So let's uh, let me ask you about that. Like, I had no idea like you even had the ability. It's like, um, what are those? You know, after school, people go, they join something, and they get sent to somewhere in the world. And they don't really have any say in where they're going. Oh yeah, I, like a peace corps or something. Yeah, I always thought firefighters. You're kind of like this is your your house or your station and so how is it how easy it is to like move on and change it up well for my department we publish a list of vacancies every month and so you can you can move 
if there's an opening, you can move there. So usually people will show up and they'll kind of kick the tires. They'll come in, they'll bring a pie or some ice cream or something at dinner and they'll talk to the crew and they'll hang out for maybe an hour or whatever. And they'll say, I'm thinking about putting in for the, the spot. And then, you know, so they hmm. kind of get a chance to kind of see what it's like. And we all know kind of, we all know what's up. So. Yeah. But like, that's interesting. It's like rushing, you know, fraternities almost or sororities, <laughs> but like, aren't you curious? Like, you know, some guys like jerky boys, like, yeah, I had to leave an old job because I had differences with my boss. Like, you're probably wondering if this guy has got a pattern, like, do you do your due diligence or this woman like on why they've made four moves in the last three years? Oh yeah. We all know. Okay. We all know. It's it. uh, you know, it's, it's a job that uh, you, you do, or you don't like when you show up the fire and they're like, grab the 24 and throw it to the second floor. And somebody just grabs it and does it and throws the bladder up there. And then somebody drops it three times or has a hard time, you know, getting in the right place or doesn't even go to the right place. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of variety of, of how people's brain works and, and how people accomplish a task, but we know, we know who we're, who we're going to rely on. And then we know who we're going to like kind of help out a little bit. So this, yeah, this is interesting. So someone comes in, brings you ice cream and hangs out. You probably have a beat on them, right? Like their history, yeah. some, okay. So it's not like a total, you know, blind date. No, 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 no. Got and it. it's, you know, we're all firefighters, so we all work for the same organization. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's a, it's a job of reputation in some ways. Like Got you it. really kind of have to, you have to protect your reputation. Okay. You so maybe want, everybody has that guy in their job. Yeah. For no, it's totally be that guy. So like, I, I'm just thinking out loud, like maybe, um, I want to, you know, I, I moved from North Bend and I want to live in Magnolia and it just makes sense for me to be closer or, um, you know, two of my best friends just left and, you know, I kind of want to try something different start. I mean, what are typically the reasons why a firefighter might make a move to a different station? Well, sometimes it's, uh, if people are ambitious and they want to promote and they mm. want to be very, very busy and, uh, they want to, uh, that's what I did the first that's the advice I give to all the new people. Be as busy as you can your first 10 years while you have the energy and the you're just so you're you're so excited to go to work every day. You're like, what are we going to get? Oh my God, that was awesome. You know, working on Aurora between 85th and 145th, pretty interesting place. See a lot of weird stuff, a lot of weird stuff, and a lot of the span of human existence. So um, working downtown, you know, you're up all night, you're literally working for 24 hours a day. Um, you know, just, just being as busy as you can early in your career. Yeah. Um, That's interesting. Like Medina must be rough too. Like lattes, they spill, burns them. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Uh, okay. So let's talk about upward mobility. Cause you're bringing up a good point of, yeah. You know, when people think they want to be a firefighter, but there's probably a lot of levels of roles that someone could play. I mean, are there 50? Are there 10? I mean, how many different levels are there? So the career path is you, you come in, you're a recruit firefighter for a year, then you become a firefighter. You're kind of on probation that first year and you're fine as long as you don't completely like drive the fire engine into the wall or you don't have a bad attitude. That's what gets people that's what burns people and actually gets them kicked is bad attitude and not able to roll with the punches or not able to be the new person, not being able to be the new person and just soak it up, listen to the feedback. It's for your benefit. Um, just, you know, work hard. Don't sit around. Um, so you have, you have probationary firefighters and you have firefighter. Then you have, we have lieutenants. There's going to be a lieutenant that's in charge of each apparatus. So you're in charge of your crew. And then there's a captain who's in charge of the station. And then there's the chief who's in charge of the battalion. What's battalion? So, How do you define battalion? So the 6th battalion in Seattle is basically kind of rough, very roughly speaking. It's from I-5 north of the ship canal up to the city limits and east of... I-5. So it's a geographical area. 
the city is split up into six battalions. So there's six battalion chiefs, and then there's a deputy chief. You, you take a test as a lieutenant. There's a bibliography that's published. Study, 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 take your test. Then once again, there's an oral board where they will give you uh, scenarios that you have to go through. You have to talk through the scenario, manage the situation. And it's everywhere from HR to a, you know, three alarm fire. And then the captain's process will be the same. You have to take a test. You'll be ranked in order based on quantifiable scores. And then when an opening comes up, you'll, you'll be promoted to that spot. And then the same is true for chiefs. So you can do, yeah. you hi hierarchically, I don't even know if that's a word, in the hierarchy of things, you can move from firefighter to chief over the course of your career. You could also be a paramedic. Uh, that's a whole different one-year process. A medic, you go, to, you go to medic one training and it's about a year. Uh, we have a boat, we have boaties that work on the fireboat. That's a whole different training. Um, we have technical units, specialty units, hazmat, um, technical rescue. Uh, so there's lots of, in Seattle anyway, and this is specifically for my department, there's a benefit for being in a large department. If you go to work for Duval, it, I think the process still works the same, but it's a little, it's, it's going to take a lot longer to become a lieutenant. You might, it might take you 20 years to become a lieutenant just because there's not that many spots and somebody has to retire. So I'm thinking about like normal business when people, like for me, I, I got into technology and for some reason I thought I wanted to be in, you know, fast, exciting, sexy technology. And I realized when I was there, you know, it was very political and I didn't have a lot of control. Like I would do really well and my quota would get raised, my commission would get cut, a new manager would come in, it, it just was, but in your world, like I'm thinking about the politics of moving up. Like on one hand, when I think of a firefighter, I think of just a really good person that's committed to serve. That's probably in shape is just a, an assumption I have that is, you know, that gets into potentially dangerous situations to help people. But then, you know, what you're talking about is, you know, when you get into those higher positions, are, are people like do you see people in your world? I'm trying to articulate this. I apologize. I'm not saying it very well, but some people just want to be a firefighter, right? And they don't want to play the game. But when you get up to that level, are those typically people that are more business savvy or oriented, or are they like legit firefighters that just want to climb the ladder? Yeah, I mean, well, since everybody has to do the same process, everybody has to be a firefighter, and then you have to be a firefighter for five years. So, mm. and then you have to be a lieutenant for, I don't know, three or four, then you have to be a captain for three or four years. So everybody kind of has the same requirements to get to those levels. And the higher you get, it does get more political. Like, uh, I, I, I've been a firefighter for 26 years and I rode on the tailboard for 25 years because I liked the job. I liked actually just getting on the rig, doing the work. I like to be the first person through the door. I like to do the patient interview. I like to be directly involved with helping this person, like physically touching the person to treat them, to treat the wound, to put the splint on, to you know, help pick them up, carry them out of their house. Um, but you don't, and, and in that, that part of the job, Dirk, is I like it because it's, it's exceptionally, uh, uh, well, it's demanding and complicated, but it's really simple on the other, on the other way. I, I show up and I just get to do my job. I put my boots on the rig and it's like, let's go. You know, the bell hits, we go. And then we just get to do that. And then we come back and then until the bell hits again, and then we go, it was, uh, it's been, it's been so gratifying for the last 26 years. Um, I'm grateful looking back now, I'm a couple of years away from retirement, but I'm, I don't have any regrets that I didn't become a Lieutenant or a captain or a chief or because the job changes, the job really, really changes and you get farther away you're in control of more and you're still helping people, but you're not that person that's actually 
being the human being that is helping this person on their worst day, which is by, by far the most gratifying part of the job. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, what is the one thing you love? Is it just being that, that, I mean, I, I've been in situations that whether I've medically or whatever, but when the professional comes and I don't want to say saves the day, but like, whether it's a, a great doctor that is working on your child or uh, something, you know, they just fix it or they give yeah. you some sense of security and make you feel safe. That, yeah. that, that's priceless, isn't it? Oh, it's so gratifying. It's yeah. just so gratifying. Like sometimes just holding, holding the little 85 year old lady's hand and just telling her it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And, and she just looks at you and she's like, okay, I think it's going to be okay. And then you make it okay. You know, you're responsible to take care of that person. And then you make it okay. You, you, you just, it's very, it's a very unique job, Dirk. You really just help people. That's kind of what I've been able to do for the last 26 years is just help people. So, I mean, again, I haven't seen you in a while, but like, I know who you are. I mean, you don't have to spend, like, I've always thought of you as like, it's no surprise when you're talking about what you love out of this job. Like I could see like, yeah, I see you in that role completely going back in time a little bit, you know, maybe not too long, but like high school, college, out of college, did you see signs that led you like that made, oh, okay, this makes sense. Like, were you a helper by nature? Were you a guy that kind of diffused situations in the fraternity? Were you, I mean, you're certainly a likable guy and everybody seemed to have great things to say about you. Were there signs back in the earlier days that kind of make sense now? You know, that's interesting. I don't know if I have a good answer to that because I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I think I just kind of fell into it. The, you know, the customer service thing, I think maybe just working in the, in customer service, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I liked it. I liked being a bartender. Um, I liked uh, taking care of people, I guess. I don't know. I like people have a good time, you know? Yeah. I like to make sure that everybody's kind of having a good time or things are figured out and, you know, keep yeah, I mean, in the raft kind of thing. When you're talking about being the first through the door, the greeter or whatever you called it. Yeah. I could see you doing that. And that's kind of like, I think you've done that in life, like in different ways, just kind of when, when I think about the times we've had together, like you're a good introduction. I mean, I don't know if you're a rush chairman, but you probably would have been a great rush chairman, but just, just the face and, you know, cause on the other side of that door is fear. And I, I'm saying these things cause I'm trying to like get in the head. I want, I want people that are considering the firefighter route to think about these things is, you know, there's, there's cool things that you hear about, like the freedom, the lifestyle, the pension, and I might have assumptions I'm wrong, but, but it's also a very real job where when the time comes, you have to perform and deliver and whether it's, you know, the smells or an accident, death, um, you don't know what's on the other side of that door, literally. Yeah. So you have to be, I think you have to have a personality um, and temperament that you need to be prepared for whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the other benefits is that we, we work with a team. There's four of us. So sometimes, sometimes other people are the lead. Sometimes people, you know, everybody kind of takes a turn stepping in and sometimes it's not your zone. Sometimes it's not your groove and the other person steps in or, or they're, they're going down a path and it's, they're getting super frustrated or things aren't working out. And then you got to step in and help your teammate, teammate and, mitigate the situation and uh it's all about being a team and working together like really kind of a unique situation you're spending 24 hours together but you're you're fixing these problems as as a team yeah and your leadership is is important your your boss is important they set the tone so yeah culturally as we um Sorry, I have an itch, but there's nothing wrong with your nose. It's so funny when you do this. Isn't that funny? The other person does this. Do I have some moment, Dad? No, I just like, I totally, I do the same thing. It's just like, no, it's just my problem. I think you don't have anything. Okay, so 
taking uh, this question is like not uh firefighter centric so yeah. this is about the lifestyle of being a firefighter um and not to be pessimistic but is there anything that you would warn people about like for me like when i got out of technology and then i um i thought i wanted to be a child psychologist and i did that for a while uh, i went to school and then at the same time i i needed a job to pay the bills and that's how i fell into lending but one of the things i've really realized that i love about my career is the freedom and the ability to wake up and go to bed with my kids take them to school i don't ever i've never missed a birthday ne never will never missed holidays um i coach all their i coached all their sports i was i'm very present and to me that's like more important than a million dollars yeah as a firefighter like i think i would have a hard time being gone for three or four days i mean my dad was a pilot so he was gone half the month but that was a good thing because he was kind of a son of a bitch sometimes but i love him but he was tough so but as a firefighter i think that would be really hard for me to to leave the family are there things that i don't want to put words in your mouth but are there things that um you can talk about that you don't like uh as far as the lifestyle in your profession sure i'll talk i'll talk to both of those things the good and the bad uh just frankly cancer cancer gets us we're exposed to all kinds of bad bad shit you know a car fire it's all plastic and rubber and chemicals and you know you 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 just can't avoid it sometimes the smoke you're you're in that stuff or a house you don't know what's in the house uh they're just figuring out that all this fire retardant stuff that they used to make furniture from is massively carcinogenic and causes cancer for everybody. Just sitting on the couch, you know, gives people exposures. And then when it burns, that's a whole nother level. So there's, there's that there's PTSD, which is a real, real issue with us. We're getting so much better at being able to talk about that stuff with each other to support each other to, uh, you know, you know, I, I'll just, I'll just go all the way. There's, there's the PTSD with suicide. Suicide sometimes is an issue. Uh, we had a guy at my station just kind of kill himself last year and variety of variety of causes, not just because he couldn't deal with his job, but um, it, it's a thing. It is, it is, can be a thing. And uh, we have support systems set up for everybody. And, uh, so there's there's there are some mental health drawbacks and it's tough and I've been very very lucky the benefits um, I've been very lucky to have a spouse who's completely aligned we're very much aligned and uh, we're not so much into the roles of this is you do this stuff around the house I do this stuff uh, you're supposed to be this way I'm supposed to be that way so when I'm gone for 24 hours. Um, you know, it's not, it's not such a problem. Uh, I work with a guy who has four kids every night after dinner, he zooms his kids for an hour. So he's just got them on his phone, just a little zoom call. They run around. I can hear them, you know, screaming and running around their little kids. So he gets a little touch. He gets a little, you know, check in with his family. Uh, but then you work your 24 hour shifts and you have two days off. And then you work 24 hour shift, 24 hour shift and you have four days off. And that's what our schedule is. Okay. Um, so sorry to interrupt, but you're only, I was going to ask, like I had the assumption that you might be gone for five nights at the station. Is that not the case? No, 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 no. It's usually 20, it's 24 hour shift, but uh, I'll, I'll work an overtime shift. So I'll be away for 48 or if I want to make a trade, I can make a trade. But see, if I make a trade and work 48 hours, I could have a week off after that because I just traded away that second shift. So or somewhere in my calendar. It's really flexible. I can make trades all over the place. So Ona and I are going to, uh, to Europe and we're going to be gone for three weeks. And I just used I used three vacation days and three trades and I just covered covered my spot. So so, so flexibility I, is huge. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like thinking people like, listen, like flexibility, freedom. Um, I mean, these are the things that you need to consider when choosing a profession. I mean, you might want to go serve and, uh, but you need to understand that the, the ins and outs of 
the daily grind, right? Um, you know, my, it's funny. I told my wife I was going to have you on the show, and she wanted me to ask you about the um, the environmental, uh, you know, stuff that you're exposed to. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm so really glad you brought that up because I was going to forget that one. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting when I not this isn't about me, but, you know, I like to talk about me. I'm kidding. Uh, but when I was going to psychology school, I was like, you know, I'm going to have a really hard time helping a young, young kid if his dad's abusing him because I'm going to go knock on the door and kick his dad's ass, you know, and, <laughs> and like I realized, like, I can't do this gig because I'm just like, I, I, I just can't. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when I hear you talk about like seeing some of these accidents, like people dying and, and I, I just, how do you, I guess the question is, I think is how do you, how do you leave that at work and go home? And when you, you know, hug your wife and your kids, how do you separate that? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. I mean, there have been days that I've come home and I've been a complete asshole for the whole day because it's just it's I can't I can't get right. I mean, there's obviously not a just a psychological switch. You just turn it off. Sometimes people are, are perfectly fine. And then it comes back a month later, a year later, or you get a very similar run that there's a trigger and then it and then you just find yourself struggling, you know, with just staying positive or being happy or being a good parent or husband or, you know, being the spouse of a firefighter or police officer. It's a real thing. It's it's not it's not an easy situation because sometimes your your person comes home and you just got to leave them the hell alone. You know, I need to mow the lawn for like three hours. And just I'm going to be out in the yard listening to music and just don't, don't, you know, I'm, I need to be by myself for a little while. And so being aligned and, and being able to have somebody that supports that, um, it's, it's vital. It's vital for like long-term kind of happiness. Man, I, Rich, you're throwing out so many things. Like I thought I, I thought I kind of would have an idea where this would go and, but you're throwing out things I haven't even thought about. Um, as we wind this down, um, two things that I always kind of want to throw out at the end, two questions. One has to do with if you were to go back in time coming out of the University of Washington, you know, I mean, I know hindsight 2020, but like if you know what you know now, would you go down the same path, the same career route? Oh my God, I would have I would have done it so much earlier. I didn't I didn't find this Dirk until I was 30. So in some ways, this is a, you know, I'm kind of the a good person to talk to kind of for the theme of what you're, what you're doing here is I kind of meandered and then I found this, yeah. but like you said, hindsight being 2020, if I would have, although I don't think I was emotionally mature enough to do this job, I do get a little concerned when I, when I have a, a rookie who's 22 years old and I'm like, how are you going to kind of wrap your head around some of the stuff you're going to see here? I mean, some of the dynamics, the human dynamics that you're going to see are going to, be a little troubling to figure out. And if you have a little bit of a baseline to work off of, it's it helps quite a bit. So, but to answer your question, I would have done it earlier. I wish I would have, you know, 25, 26. I wish I would have got into this. So I'd be retired right now. If I did. <laughs> so that kind of leads me to my other question. But before I ask the last question, um, and not to get political at all, but I've had a lot of friends through the years. I remember pursue this route. It, you know, a question that people need to consider is like the other day I had a, a guest and he is a recruiter in big technology, works for a division at IBM. And he was literally told that you cannot hire white males, for example, I'm just being blunt, you know, because we, and so in, as a firefighter, is it difficult? Like, can anybody become a firefighter or is like, do certain, you know, people, groups have a harder time getting hired? Um, that's, you know, I, I alluded to that a little bit with the difference of the culture 25 years ago versus now. And uh, with the city that I work for, Seattle, it's co completely committed to diversity and you know, having a diverse workforce, welcoming all types of people, different colors, different genders, 
Um, and it's, I, I, yeah, I mean, with it, I don't even really see it as like a political issue unless somebody makes it a political issue. But the beauty of the job that I have is that you can either do it or you can't. And you have to go through this kind of crucible of the recruit school that's 16 weeks long. And it's like military boot camp. It's a grind physically, mentally, everything. It's exhausting. And people, people just bail. I mean, people get the light bulb and they're like, this is not for me. I am not interested in this at all. I don't like being yelled at. I don't like being super tired. My body just is killing me, but I have to keep going. Um, I don't like being stressed about tests and am I going to get this job? And then, you know, so you can either do this job or you can't. And it becomes apparent. It becomes self-apparent, I would hope. So, I mean, basically anyone can is, is a candidate. Yeah, I think cool. so. I mean, you have to know what you're getting into. Yeah. You have to want to do it. I think yeah. some of the candidates that go into recruit school and quit have been told, oh, my gosh, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. And you should join this. You should do this. And you can't you can't be convinced to do this to do this job. You have to want to do this job. And the only way you can kind of figure that out is to like you're doing now, do some research, try to talk to as many people as you can, get into the process. And then if it's for you, go for it. You got to go. You got to go for it to be successful. You have to be in. Yeah, it's it's the cool thing is it's almost like a weeding out process. It's like you don't become a firefighter unless you're probably supposed to be right. Yeah. I mean, I have some friends, I have some really good friends who would have been awesome firefighters, you know, but until you get that poop, pee, blood, saliva, hmm. you know, gross, gross stuff. So, you know, you might think you're, you're in, but you gotta be able to, that's, oh, that's interesting. Really kind of a deal breaker. Okay. So I was, one of the questions is it like, from start to finish, from the moment you submit your application, you do all these tests, you do the physical, the 16 week, and then you become a firefighter where it's a year of on probation. Yeah. Is that a two year process, a one year process? To, you know, a, it, it depends on where you start the process. Like the, the day you get called by your city to say, we're going to, we have a spot for you in our recruit class that now starts your 16 weeks. And then you have a year after that. But you got to take these tests and go through these oral boards where sometimes the yeah. first oral board I went to, Dirk, I literally just. Because uh, 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 it was so intimidating. I thought I was prepared. I practiced. I knew all my answers. And then I got in the actual hot box with like three other people. And I was like, oh, and then I was super bummed because I knew I had to wait a year. I had to wait another year. To get that opportunity. Now I test, you can test, you can test with, you can test all up and down the West coast. You can test in Portland, but guess what? When you get hired, guess where you're going to live for the next 25 to 30 years. You better be okay living in Portland or you better be okay living in Sacramento or Reno or wherever you test. Cause that's what you're going to do. So that's if you're some, yeah. So if you're someone that wants to live in Sun Valley half the year and ski, and be a firefighter in Seattle, it's probably not a conducive career for that. No, it's not going to work. But you have four days off every week that you can go skiing at Crystal. Yeah. Three days a week if you want. Yeah. Or you could snowshoe or you could hike or you could, you know, it's it's the flexibility of the schedule. But like actually, geogra you're geographically centered where your job yeah, is. I get it. No. Um, okay. So winding this down. Um, you talked a little bit about retirement. That is that how long from now? Uh, you know, I can't retire before Ona does. So I uh she's probably got, I don't know, a little less than two years. Okay. So, so my two I'm years. Like two or three years. Yeah. Okay. So the question I always ask is let's just say you can't be a firefighter, right? Like go back in time, whatever. It was just off the table. Is there a dream job? Like if you could do anything, I mean just, the reason I ask this is because I think it's interesting for an, the audience to kind of hear someone talk for 40 minutes about being a firefighter 
And then, you know, think they know somebody and, and then all of a sudden realize they want to be an artist or a painter or a dancer or whatever is i just, it's always interesting for me to like, cause you and I, you know, we used to hang out a lot, but I don't think we had this conversation when we were watching uh, CSN at the gorge. What would you did, but we don't remember it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what, uh, what, what would you do? Like, what's a dream job? Like, what would you absolutely like be ecstatic about doing? This is going to sound corny, but I just, I, I like what I'm doing. I, uh, and it's not that I, I don't, couldn't do any other job or, you know, maybe something in medicine, maybe, I don't know, but I was never, I was never an academic. I was never that guy in, I was, I was an English major and it took me six years to get out of the UW. So I was never super academically focused. Right. Um, I, I honestly, I, as this is probably not the thing to say on a podcast about jobs, but your job is only part of who you are also, you know, if you can have a fulfilling life and build these other concentric rings of your life around this particular ring of your job that fits in with this, um, I think I probably could have been happy doing any number of things. Cause I, yeah. I just, I love my family and I like where I live and, you know, I've been able to make some good decisions. So that's a good point. Like, I'm not saying that your career and job defines you. All I'm trying to do is maybe nudge people to think a little more clearly about, cause the amount of time you spend in your career is significant. Right. Um, and I just, like, I've seen people uh, separate themselves from the pack in any industry like and the common denominator is always passion and yeah. uh genuine enthusiasm and i just i just think it'd be a, a better world if we we had people thinking differently about choosing their careers and but you know i've known super happy people that if they can get two weeks a year to go fishing they're good you know um watch you know so i'm not saying that you have to love love your job i just would like to see more people um, yeah. pay attention to that. But this has been really good. I, I, I think you gave a lot of great information. I think there's people watching this right now that are really probably excited and interested in getting in. And maybe there's some people that you brought some things up and they didn't even consider about the, the smells and the sights and the, the gore, um, you know, that maybe, you know what, maybe this podcast saved them a few years of trying to go down the wrong road. Um, before I end this, is there anything that you feel inclined or that you wanted to say that's just at the, you know, before I say goodbye? No, I mean, uh, we'll continue our conversation when you turn the mic off because I haven't talked to you for so long. But uh, no, I mean, I really like what you're doing here, Dirk. It's really a unique kind of, um, it's really needed. It's really a unique kind of approach. I mean, I have a 24 year old who is literally in this zone right now of who do I want to be? What do I want to do? What job do I want? Do I pursue just the job? Do I go to graduate school for a particular thing? But I don't even know what that thing is. You know, we don't do a good job with young people or I, I don't know if it's doing a good job or anything, but the, the young, the poor young person is trying to figure this out. You don't really know what you don't know and you don't even really know anything about a job and if you're not lucky enough to shadow somebody or spend time with that person in the job and then but we don't provide those opportunities to young people to do that you really got to get in there and network and find people and pursue opportunities which are three things that 22 and 24 year olds are not really hip to at that age so yeah you're right i mean the, also, what you're doing. the thank you there's also kids in like city inner cities for example that don't have exposure to successful role models right they don't they may not have access to someone they can come talk to about being a firefighter um but i i think you're right we don't at 22 24 you're thinking about you know getting a job getting a car you know making paying off college debt, making your mom and dad proud, whatever. But, but, um, you know, with your son, you know, my, my advice is just really take a step back and like 
you know, whether it's your social media, look at the kind of stuff that you spend time researching. Like I had a guest on today, his son uh, is really into cars and he's fascinated with like fixing cars. And I had a client a couple weeks ago on and his son's fascinated with roller coasters. And there's probably a million jobs having to deal with roller coasters, like selling them, selling the metal, uh, the engineering of them, um, the insurance, insuring them. Um, but I think it's, I think it's important to kind of, for anyone that's struggling, like lower the bar. This isn't a race you're ever going to win. Nobody wins the race of success. Um, the bus is always going to, uh, Jesse Itzler is a guy that I really like. He talks about the bus is always moving, whether you, you know, we're all going to die. We only have so much time, but the bus keeps going. But I would really pay attention if you're, if you're craving a, a more joyful and better life, I think your odds are going to increase if you pay attention to what really excites you, you know, and try to maybe leverage that in your career if you're so lucky. So anyways, I'm rambling. Rich, thanks so much for uh, taking the time. And um, let's talk for a little bit after. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Good job. Thank you, buddy. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks.